We are super excited to welcome a wonderful vocalist to the show who's worked alongside some incredible talent, including Jennifer Lopez, Christina Aguilera, Maroon 5, and the legendary Diana Ross and Patti LaBelle. Jill Zaday is currently working with the Queen of Pop, Janet Jackson, on her Unbreakable World Tour, and we thank her for taking the time to talk to us. Jill, welcome to The Kelly Alexander Show. Oh, well, thanks so much. It's great to be here. So can we start off by asking about how your musical journey in life began? Uh, well, I am from a small island off the coast of Massachusetts called Martha's Vineyard. And um, as as you can imagine, the island is a very small community. And uh, but I grew up here like sheltered, uh, as you can imagine. But um, I always sort of had just um, an unusual sort of style of music, an unusual taste. As a young kid, I liked people like you know, Aretha Franklin and Anita Baker. And um, I think I, I think she was one of, actually Janet Jackson, believe it or not, was my first record I ever, my tape, I bought the tape, not the record. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but um, but Aretha Franklin, and um, I always would, uh, I would listen to them and I could sort of uh, imitate what I heard on the radio, but I didn't at that point really know it was, you know, I, could, I was doing something other people really couldn't do. But um, I sooner uh, realized that in high school when I started singing really in front of people. And then I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Uh, I graduated there with a degree in music business and songwriting. Awesome. Now, I read uh, that you were like a shy person growing up, and I understand that because I was the same way. When you sing and you get on stage, do you sort of, is it kind of like your alter ego a little bit, or do you just get to sort of put the shyness to the side? Because that's how I feel when I'm on the radio. Yes. I don't know if I'd call it an alter ego to go that far, but it's definitely, it's put on. And it's funny that people tell me that they can't see that quite often, but yes, I would definitely have to come out of myself, for sure. I was very shy, you know, being from the island, and then I go to, you know, just in, in the beginning, uh, to Boston, big, you know, the big city, and I'm just like, I'm the shyest thing you could possibly think of. But when I sang, people listened and it was really my voice that sort of made my way you know uh, career-wise and you know even socially among my peers at college. Now what would you consider to be your first big break in the business? Did it sort of happen in Boston or was it when you did move west to Los Angeles? Um, I will say I had a, I've had a, a bunch of kind of spikes you know real like high highs and um, like they sort of come out of nowhere in, when I was in college, I did uh, sing background randomly for um, back then. He was called Puff Daddy, yeah, <laughs> or P Diddy Combs. Um, I sang background uh, for him in Boston. Uh, but really, as far as like a steady sort of career, um, it really when I moved to LA, uh, I worked uh, for my first tour was uh, working for a singer named Javier, who was I believe the first winner of NBC's The Voice. Mm-hmm. And we were opening for Maya, so that was the first tour. She's back in probably 2003, um, and yeah, so LA was really when I started working like regularly, um, professionally. Now, for someone who's listening who who may want to have a career, sort of doing what you do, uh, or even just wants to have mm-hmm. a career uh, just in in the singing realm in general, um, how important is is education and school? Would you say to to someone who's listening right now? Like, do you are you happy you have your degree? Well, this is what I will tell you. Um, I would never discourage someone for getting, a, you know, going to college and, and getting an education. But in my experience, really, what has benefited me most in my career was actually the people I was going to school with. The people that I were going to school with were people that were going to eventually be out in the industry working. So in itself, it was a networking tool, even more so than, you know, having a degree from college. That's not going to get me a gig anywhere. But, you know, surrounding yourself with people that are working in the industry is really, that's really uh, where, you know, and then I was amongst, you know, very, very talented people, you know, and educated musically. So so it, it definitely, it definitely helped. But that is not the thing that would get me the gig today. Now, make sure to follow Jill on her social media. You can follow her on Instagram and on Twitter and on Facebook at Jill Zaday. Now, um, I wanted to ask you, when did you have the first opportunity to to work with Janet Jackson? Because if I've done my homework, it sounds like you've sort of been working with her for the last 10 years or so. Yes. Um, I um, it got Well, the way auditions work, especially for major artists like that, is generally an invitation only, as opposed to having a huge cattle call. Mm-hmm. 
And my name got thrown into the pot by someone by the name Rex Salas, who you may be familiar with as he's toured with Janet Jackson for over 20 years. He's not on the current tour, but has been on every tour beforehand. So um, he was a musical director when I sang background for a few few gigs with, for Lindsay Lohan. And um, he referred me for that audition. And then um, there were 20 trios of a tenor, alto, soprano. There's 20 trios selected. And we all were came to audition and they just started to weed out people within the trios and then inter, you know, change them. And then they narrowed it finally down to me and two other singers. Wow, that's awesome. It's so cool to hear this because we've been fortunate on the show to have so many of Janet's dancers on the show, but never any of her vocalists. So mm-hmm. it's kind of really cool to hear yeah. how you guys came together. And if I also understand things correctly, you and Aaron have have kind of been dancing or singing for Janet for a while as well together. Did you guys meet at that audition? We did not meet at that audition. Um, it's a funny story. Um, the, this, the, uh, but there was shortly thereafter, um, there was another soprano that got hired and she got pregnant or was pregnant and didn't realize the amount of work that was ahead and had to bow out though we were all then headed to Atlanta to start rehearsing for an upcoming tour so we had to then hire a new singer in Atlanta and the musical director at the time Daryl Smith asked for my help and you know and so forth to sort of meeting with the singers beforehand to uh, make sure that they the new songs you know and just to kind of get a, a listen beforehand and um, Aaron was one of those singers, and um, I, you know, I definitely told him beforehand. I'm like, you can listen to all the other girls, but that's the one. <laughs> and um, of course, that's the one that Miss Jackson and he both thought was the best one as well. So, um, and from that moment on, um, not only was she like amazing to sing, but she became a very, very good friend, and we have some a bunch of things musically together, and um, will in the future as well, I believe. That's awesome. So can you talk to us, if you take us back a little bit to that that, that first Janet tour that you were on, because which which tour was your first one with Janet, actually? Well, I will say um, that in the beginning, there were a lot of starts to tours, but then they didn't finish. Okay. We started um, in the Bahamas, and it was actually the Atlantis, which is like a resort in, in the Bahamas, and it was the opening to the Big Third Wing, and Janet was doing five songs and so we went to the Bahamas for two weeks and was there to rehearse for uh, one show really of five songs but um, then there there was supposed to be some touring thereafter and that didn't happen and then the discipline record we started to do uh, we did a promo tour you know with the TV shows and and so forth and I don't believe uh, we did much of a tour thereafter and then there was um, Rock With You where they didn't have background singers. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, the number ones tour, which was the last tour, um, which was a full tour for 2011 and a little bit into 12. And then this tour. So there's been a lot of, you know, ups and downs and um, starts and stops, but it's been, you know, it's, uh, she's been very loyal to her band, which is, you know, pretty awesome. It's just, it's really been great to work with her after all this time. Can you talk to us about what it was like when you actually got the job? Because again, we've been fortunate to hear from some of her dancers and, and just the excitement when they got the news. So, and, and, and it felt like too, with regards to the dancers that Janet has a a big hand in, in making those final decisions. It was that the same way with regards to you guys and the band members. It was, um, because I started right when she hired three new singers. So, and I've been there since. So, um, how she, she was, uh, you know what, when I first auditioned, it was actually videotaped, um, for her to view later. So I think the musical down, the musical director had chosen what he thought. And then she listened and, and then agreed. However, when we went to Atlanta to hire the second soprano, um, she was there to, to audition the singers. So I think it was like a location thing at the time, but she ultimately, yes, did the choosing herself. That's awesome. And what's it like to have Janet Jackson as a boss? Can you describe that for us? It's 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 crazy because sometimes, you know, when you're on the tour, you, you kind of get in a tour bubble and you sort of forget who you're with, you know, um, and, and who, who you really are in the company of. And someone like Janet Jackson, I mean, it's it doesn't really get much larger that, than that in the way of pop artists. 
And um, she wouldn't know it really being in her presence. Of course, if we're, you know, in public, you know, she's, she's very, actually, it's funny in public, I never even see her because she slips out and slip, you know, slips in and out. And we never even know where she came from. <laughs> but um, in, in person, she's, she's very, um, she's very quiet, but um, she's very, very sweet and incredibly generous. And it really, um, and she, that, that has never changed. I've never seen uh, any other, anything else from her. So I only have good things to say. That's amazing. I actually remember one of her her dancers who was actually, I think, a, a still a good friend of hers, Kelly Kono, talking about how um, yeah. at the, yeah, so you know Kelly, obviously, and um, I remember yeah. Kelly saying, because uh, I think Janet was sort of Kelly's first big job, you know, back in the early 90s, and, and then after mm-hmm. that initial tour, I, obviously Kelly went on to dance with other people, and then of course come back to Janet, and she mm-hmm. sort of mentioned that dancing for Janet is, it, or and working with Janet is just so different than anyone else, because, uh, and she didn't realize, because it's almost like she went to the top of the heap right Right away and then everyone else sort of was a, a bit of a different ride do you notice the difference right. working for like a janet as uh, opposed to some of the other artists because you've obviously worked with some major talent as well apart from janet well yes i mean she's just incredibly professional and um you know we i, I don't have as much you know face time let's say with her as opposed to one of the dancers because they're 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 you know in you know we're dancing rehearsal for dancing more so than they are in with the band but um she doesn't miss anything I'll tell you that she's definitely you know she knows exactly everything that's going on and um it's just very professional there's not um you know I I feel humbled um working because I know that she she's you know she's not just you know your average pop star you know what I mean she's an educated you know musician and singer and artist that has been doing this forever and um, it shows. It really does. She, she doesn't miss a beat. Can you talk to us or walk us through um, like a day in rehearsal for you guys when you guys were getting ready for the tour? Like for, you know, because first of all, you know, we know that the tour kicked off at the end of August. But how quickly or how early were you brought in, Jill? Um, well, it kicked off the end of August. I believe we started the last week of July. Um, and it starts off where um, usually the band is rehearsing in their own room, the dancers are rehearsing in their own room, and then us, the singers, are rehearsing in our own room. So everyone's got their separate corners that they're, you know, perfecting their own part. And then uh, slowly but surely we start to, you know, integrate everyone together. And um, pretty much it's the most intense as you can imagine the last week where everyone's pulling really long days. But, you know, in the beginning, it's kind of like your average work day, like eight hours. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're just a lot of it's review because, of course, you know, I've been listening to her songs for, you know, since I can remember. Mm-hmm. But, of course, there are uh, there's a new album and we've got a lot of new music to learn. So um, a lot of that is just spent on reviewing and, you know, making sure we got our corner together. So when we all come together, it's just all sort of, you know, it's the, it's really just a bit of tweaking here and there as opposed to rehearsing everybody from start. When it comes to the backup vocalist, because I know it's it's you and and uh, and Aaron, and I want to pronounce this correctly, is it Onitsha? I just want to make sure I don't blow yep, that. Yeah, you did that right. Um, so when it comes to, to you three working together as a unit, do you, like is there a leader within your three, or or do you sort of defer to the band leader and 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 is suggestions from you guys like like welcomed? I guess. Um, no, really, we handle it ourselves. You know, we because I think everybody, uh, you know, is that that that's involved is at a level of musicianship that they can, you know, be for, for the most part expected to learn their part. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the three of us individually can go find our own part, you know, when we're on our own and then we'll come together and just make sure and compare notes and make sure we have everything, you know, that everything sounds right. And then um, when we come in, you know, if there's a tweak here and there that the musical director happened to notice, like, Hey, I think, this is, you know, the this note is off here, or I think you need to sing this note instead. You know, that for the most part, we, we kind of, we kind of, we've just been doing it for so long that you, you know, your ear just naturally goes to, you know, your part. And, um, and then, you know, as, as doing it for years and years and years, you just kind of pick it up a lot faster. Do you guys ever switch parts or, you know, obviously I'm, I'm sure you have your tone that you sing in. So, but do you ever, ever mix mm-hmm. it up or, or, and, and how, and it just seems like, cause I, I was fortunate to see you guys in Toronto and you guys sound like a really tight yeah. unit. We don't switch up parts. Uh, that would probably just create confusion <laughs> in the long run. 
Um, we, we, we have the capability of doing so if, if, you know, say somebody was sick or, you know, for any given reason, but I have to say, I haven't come across that reason okay. uh, ever. <laughs> do you guys have a, <laughs> but, a, a, um, a pre-stage ritual before you guys go out? Like how, like how much do you guys warm up before you head out there? Uh, we do a little bit of, we'll, often we'll just have like some music on, you know, and we can kind of individually do what we need to do as far as like vocal warm ups. Um, nothing uh, really orchestrated by, you know, the three of us collectively. And then as far as other rituals, we always, everyone um, before the show heads into Janet's room and we all say a prayer uh, before we head up to the stage. Oh, that's very cool. Joining us on the, the show is uh, the very talented vocalist, Jill Zaday. Make sure to follow her on her social media, at Jill Zaday. Um, Jill, can you talk to us about the the set list with regards to, like, do you have a favorite song? I'm sure it's hard to say that because she has so many hits, but, like, is there a part of the show that you just love the most? Well, um, I like Unbreakable, which is obviously the new album. That is just a really, well, it's new, you know, it's more fresh to me, so... And I just really love the message, you know, it just, it's, I love to sing the song, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a, I Get Lonely, uh, there's a moment in the, you know, the middle of the show where um, Janet was gracious, uh, gracious enough to feature the three of us with her on that song, which is a nice, you know, moment to have, um, which I feel was like incredibly generous of her once again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... Um, uh, Come Back to Me has just probably always been one of my j- favorite Janet songs. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Now, I understand yeah. if I've read your Facebook correctly that you have a love-hate relationship with the hat that you're we- you're currently wearing on tour. <laughs> uh, yes. does, does wardrobe ever sort yes. of bother you? Because, like, first of all, I have to say, when I read the post, I, I did laugh because, I, like I said, I remember seeing you in Toronto, and I actually thought you stood yeah. out the most because you got this funky hat and then you had this really cool hair. So I think it's working for right. you. Right. <laughs> Yes, it's funny. I, I it literally is a love hate relationship, and I will spill the beans on the other girls as well as myself, saying that we often try to negotiate our way out of having to wear them. Um, it's a pretty that's pretty much as well as a before show <laughs> ritual, not necessarily to the powers that be, but just wishing that we didn't have to wear it. It's just it's it's hot, you know what I mean? Okay. But at the at you know on the other side of that coin um it's it is something that unites us you know mm-hmm. um people have will stop us and say oh you guys well, what do you guys do you know you guys are dancers or like nope <laughs> nope the, the ones bouncing off the walls over there that's the dancers or the singers <laughs> you know and um and it's sort of you know it is sort of a, a look that sort of creates a you know a unity between three of us with that does work for us so you know, while we hate to admit it, you know, the will has stayed. <laughs> well, you, like, in my opinion, you guys look really cool. So I, I give you a big high five on that one. Um, can you talk oh, to us a little you. bit about the importance of Janet's fans? Because I feel like, like, I've been fortunate to interview a lot of different artists. And I just feel like mm-hmm. Janet's fans are, you know, to a different level in a way. They just seem so loyal. And, and I feel like, again, when I was on your Facebook, I see many of them have, have you know, asked to be your Facebook friend. What does it mean to be emb- mm-hmm. embraced by, you know, her Jan fam? It's 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 amazing because you know Janet has the kind of fans that I remember, like you know when when I remember you know being I was a Michael Jackson fan when I was a kid and I like wrote him my own you know fan letter to Michael Jackson way back you know a million years ago it seems, and you'd see you know uh, the, the kind of mayhem he would create when he showed up anywhere and those fans were absolutely losing it. Like the kind of old fashioned, like good old fashioned, loyal, die hard fans. Those are the the fans that we see uh, that she has, and being embraced by that is amazing. That she really, really does have die hard fans, and it's just it's amazing to see that that even still exists. Quite honestly, mm-hmm. but of course, um, it's not surprising that they exist for her. That's great. Now, can you talk to us a little bit about you and Aaron Stevenson and, and the group that you have, a Soul Crush? Because from what I understand, you guys actually put the group together when you were on one of the previous tours. We did. Um, Soul Crush is, is something we came up with um, on the back of a tour bus last tour on the great, uh, the, the number one tour. And um, 
it sort of just came as like a light bulb kind of went off because we have such similar sensibilities when it comes to writing and music. And we only learn to uh, found out more of that um, as we, you know, worked more and more together. And um, the, as about a year and a half, two years ago, um, we started working on music and um, got a really great, actually to this, to this day, um, there's still some future plans for this music, whether it be Soul Crush or another artist or Erin herself. Um, I just sort of stopped myself in the middle of it because I felt image-wise I was um, sort of forcing myself to do something that I wasn't. Okay. However, that was the kind, the kind of music we were writing, creating together, sort of sort of um, asked for a certain image that it wasn't necessarily what I felt was me. So as far so we sort of put a, a, a sort of hiatus, I'll say, um, on what Soul Crush is. But as far as writing and, and you know, Aaron Aaron is one of my favorite uh, people, I'll say, and in the world. So um, yeah, so it's to be in store, but you 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 can find it all on either um, you know my social media or hers or or, or Soul Crush. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I, I actually saw the video, I think, of you two singing More Than Words, and you guys killed it. So I hope you do uh, yeah. do whatever you need to do, it's the two of you yeah. together. And you mentioned being sort of on the on the back of the tour bus and, and coming up with the idea. Being on mm-hmm. the road, what's the, the best and worst part of it? And what do you do during your downtime? Because I'm sure there's a fair amount of time when you are sort of just waiting around. Well, uh, I'd say the worst part of it is the... Um, the havoc it it is on uh, sleep like you know it's just sort of you kind of get it when you can because you with all the the time changes and the, just the different hours it's really hard to get you know acclimated any uh, ever so that that's probably the the hardest part but you know you again you get it when you can and it all it all works out you sleep when you're dead <laughs> <laughs> And I'm sorry, what was the other one? Yeah, and, just, and, and, the, and sort of the, the best part of being out on tour. Um, well, it just is really, I mean, it's, uh, I get to see the world. Um, and, and anywhere we're going, it's like you're, you're around people that, that love you. You mm-hmm. know, it's like people are happy and excited to see you and, and are, are just, it, it's just, it's, it's a very unique feeling being on the road. And, and having been, you know, doing it over a span of 10 plus years and, you know, I've, gone from you know being really young when I started to to my age now and um it's definitely had its you know chapters for sure I, I feel like I'm on my off time now I kind of like nice like, like to go and enjoy a nice meal somewhere like in my you know I'll go to a city that I've never been in and I'll google you know what's the best food that the city has and I'll you know I'll go and have a nice meal somewhere as was I was a younger kid you know we did the whole partying thing but you know, been there, done that. So I'll leave that to the kids. <laughs> um, now, are you going to continue? Well, I did want to ask too. When you do come off tour, like I know now, um, you guys are, are are on a break before you head out on the second leg. Is mm-hmm. it hard for you, Jill, to to kind of come off the bubble or out of the bubble and wind down a bit? Because I remember Tina Landon once telling me that it's a bit of a, I guess, like a mental shift to come out of tour mode. It is. It is definitely, and also to know that you're going back. Too, mm-hmm. you know so it's not like you can okay you know, okay what's next you know so we it'll be about five weeks total and I think actually to tell you the truth the first couple weeks were the hardest because I'm kind of I find myself being antsy you know whereas like I'm on the road and I'm begging for like any moment I can get home like oh I just want to sit on my couch mm-hmm. you know and I get three days on my couch and I you know I'm like okay <laughs> where are we going next <laughs> so you know it sits it's up and down but um Overall, you know, it's, you know, I, I, I have nothing to complain about. And do you live in Los Angeles or do you sort of stay out on the East Coast? Because I know I actually got a surprise when I interviewed little John because I guess I just assumed he spent a lot of his time in Los Angeles and then and then sort of found out he's right. in Atlanta. So where is your off season or do you even really have one? Well, I live in L.A. Okay. And what can we expect from you, you know, after the tour? Uh, do you take a bit of a break for a while and then sort of reassess and, and, and then find another artist to head out with? Is that how it works? Yeah, I mean, I'll see, you know, what what I get into after the tour. Like, I, I'm currently writing right now um, while on tour and on my break um, for my own next project. But um, as far as tours and, and long tours like this, I will probably be a little bit more selective in who I go out with because it is it is 
taxing after a while to, you know, because essentially you're, you're on the road for, for the better part of a year. So it, you know, you want to kind of sort of have some roots at home, um, which, you know, that obviously makes difficult. But as far as uh, I, I might, I may move back to the, to the East Coast here. I have a couple of business opportunities in mind. So, you know, I, and I'll kind of keep the cap on it for now, but um, again, that can be that'll be made available on my social media when the time comes. Awesome. Well, we hope that you will come back on our show when you have your next project lined up because we'd love to speak to you about it. Absolutely, I that would love that as well. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate your time. It's been so great to have you, especially because you know we're very fortunate that a lot of Janet's fans listen to the show, and I'm sure they are so happy to sort of learn about what it's like to to be in your shoes. So, thank you so much for this. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. That's the very talented vocalist Jill Zaday. Again, make sure to follow her on her social media at Jill Zaday, and her last name is spelled Z A D E H. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch the video. We've got a lot more great content coming your way, so make sure to subscribe right here and check out all that's coming up on The Kelly Alexander Show.